tracking the amazing growth of the first century church to challenge and inspire the 21st century church. This is Unstoppable Church, Then and Now, recorded on location in Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, Greece, Malta and Italy. Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont is in conversation for the next 30 minutes with David Taverner. We're continuing the conversation, Mike, about what Paul said to the Christians in ancient Corinth, where we are now, in his letter, the first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, And we've sort of reached chapter 11. I mean, that just indicates how many things uh, (laughs) there are that Paul has to say to them. Oh, he certainly does. I mean, this amazing city where we've been in the heart of the archaeological site with relics of all its ancient shopping and squares and temples and so on. And we've seen, haven't we, how some of the life of this community spilled over into the church rather than it being the other way around. And in this final section, at the end of the letter, chapters 11 to 16, we're going to look at some more issues that are all to do with how the Corinthians were gifted both sort of naturally and spiritually. And once again, they were getting influenced by the worldly atmosphere that was here in this culture around them. So how was their life together as Christians, you know, in terms of worship, for example, here in Corinth? Yeah, well, it, it was definitely getting influenced with some wrong things to the point where Paul actually says this startling comment in chapter 11, verse 17, your meetings do more harm than good. Goodness me. Yeah, that's exactly what I think when I read that. Your meetings do more harm than good. I mean, can you imagine Jesus coming into some of our churches today and saying, stop this, stop this, your meetings are doing more harm than good. Now, once again, this was something that he'd heard about. He starts by saying, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions. And one of the places those divisions were being shown was at the very place where unity was supposed to be demonstrated. And that was at the Lord's Supper. And rather than this being a demonstration of unity of the body of Christ, it was really showing fragmentation. Now, remember that in the New Testament church, the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, whatever you call it today, uh, was held in the context of a meal. So it was actually part of a meal. But what was happening was that the rich in the church were turning up early for the meeting, bringing all the food and sharing it all together. And, of course, the slaves in the church, and there would have been many, because a significant proportion of the city were slaves. So the slaves were turning up late, you know, after they'd finished serving their masters and, you know, cleaned up for them and sorted them out, rushed to the meeting to find that all the food had gone. And so Paul has to say to them in chapter 11, you know, I don't know what it is that you're sharing, but it is not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. So they've been doing more harm than good in the way they're sharing the Lord's Supper. I mean, that is devastating. But the other big area that he's now going to spend three chapters on is that their meetings are doing more harm than good in the way that they use what he calls spiritual gifts, gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to us as Christians that were supposed to be used for building up the body of Christ, for impacting the world, and instead they were being used in a selfish manner and a superior manner. So these are not sort of natural gifts uh, that each of us have to do certain things well? Well, do you know what? They sort of overlap, to be honest. And as we will read the list in a minute, there's undoubtedly some things that you could say, well, that is completely sort of supernatural, if I can use that word, Uh, whereas some others might be a mix of the two, things like wisdom. You know, there are a lot of wise people out in the world. So they overlap. And in in some ways, I don't like to distinguish between the two because it puts them in category oh, these are spiritual gifts so these are you know these are the real holy spirit things uh, but being able to keep the books balanced you know is only half spiritual and i think you know there's a whole number of places where paul talks about spiritual gifts he talks about them in romans 12 in 1 corinthians 12 and ephesians 4 and in those lists um actually some of the gifts overlap 
Uh, some are repeated, some aren't. So it looks like it's not like a conclusive list, as some Christians have sometimes thought, so much as a, a sort of a for example, these sort of gifts. So they're a mixture of what we might call rather artificially spiritual and natural gifts. Well, let's see what's in his for example lists. Well, OK, why don't we read the beginning of chapter 12? Now, we've already mentioned in a previous episode about how we'll go on to talk about the body and how all these gifts should be used together for the good of the body. But let's read the context of that, chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. He says, Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, uh, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now I just have to stop there for a minute, because that sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? That he has to tell them that no one speaking by the Spirit of God can say, Jesus be cursed. So what's going on here? It looks like some of the Corinthians were getting so overexcited about the Holy Spirit and his gifts that they weren't really concerned with the content of what they shared. What mattered to them was the show and the razzmatazz of what they shared. So, you know, perhaps imagine this person sort of, I don't know, shaking and trembling or whatever, feeling the Holy Spirit's coming among them, people are looking, and all of a sudden he says, Jesus be cursed. You think, <laughs> sorry, it's the content that matters, no matter how much you might shout, shake, rattle and roll. It's the content that matters. By the way, that is still true for every gift. Whether it's prophecy or preaching or serving, it's the content that matters. And then he goes on to say, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works in all of them. Now, now, do you notice there he keeps saying different same, different same, different same, and he mentions Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's trying to show that the whole Godhead is involved in this and that there's different, but they're the same. They're of equal value, all of these things. And then here's his first list. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between Spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of those tongues. Now, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one as he determines. So what would I underline there? First of all, to each one a spiritual gift is given. So no one's missed out. No one can say, oh, I don't have any gifts. Yeah, you do. And if you think you don't, it's just you've not discovered them yet. But everyone has at very least one gift from the Holy Spirit that the Lord can use. And all of these gifts, in all their variety, of which he gives some examples there, they're all the work and expression of the one Spirit, and he determines which gifts he gives to which person. So that's not down to the individual then, or indeed the church. It's God. Yeah, absolutely. And Paul's very strong on that in this section. These are the gifts of the Spirit. He gives them as he chooses, and he doesn't give them to you because you're a good boy or a good girl or your daddy was the pastor. He gives them freely as he chooses to every member of the body because he's passionate about the whole body being equipped to do this work together. And these gifts, are they, are they free? Oh, absolutely. Nothing to pay for them. Uh, in fact, you remember we've seen earlier in the book of Acts that Simon the magician um, tried to buy these things at one point. He said to Peter, give me this power that I too may be able to pray for people and have the spirit come on them. No, you can't buy these. Um, you can grow in them. 
I think some of them you can learn and develop in, um, but they're all given by God. You know, some of these things might be things that you've had for years in your life. You know, if you've got a particular wisdom, you just seem to come up with wise solutions in difficult situations. That may have started even when you were young because God's hand's been on your life from you being young, even before you became a Christian. So none of these can be bought. They are all gifts and they are all the gifts of the Spirit. He determines, and he goes on to talk about this in this section, about how the Holy Spirit gives whatever gifts he chooses to whatever person he chooses it for. So is it fair to say that a gift has to be received? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the Holy Spirit does not force gifts down your throat. Uh, but our passion ought to be, Holy Spirit, you know, I want as many gifts as you can give me. Not because I want to look good. Now, you know, there seem to be some element of that. Some people seem to be using these gifts in a wrong way to say, look at me, look at me, notice me, particularly the more spectacular gifts, we might call them, you know, like prophecy or speaking in tongues. It seemed to be about attracting attention to them. And, and Paul's going to say, no, it's, it's about attracting attention to Jesus. These are the gifts of his spirit, and they're meant to direct people to him. Well, we haven't got time to go into all of them in great detail. Mm. So which one should we choose? Well, look, we are going to look at the gift of prophecy, which is quite a key one that keeps recurring in a future episode. So I think we'll just park that one for the moment, not because it's unimportant, but because we're going to look at it later. So I thought what we could do is perhaps um, look at one that sometimes can be controversial. And so it'd be a good opportunity to talk about it. Um, we touched a little bit on this when we looked at the day of Pentecost. But why don't we look uh, for a few minutes at this gift of tongues, this gift of speaking in tongues. And what does that mean, speaking in tongues? Well, it does sound a bit mystical, doesn't it? A bit sort of, ooh, a bit weird. Um, but remember, the Greek word for tongues simply means languages. It's the ordinary everyday for languages. So on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit fell on all those Christians who were there, and they all began to speak in other tongues, began to speak in other languages that were understood by the crowds that gathered. The only difference is they hadn't learned those languages. And this is the thing about tongues. It is a spirit-given language, and it might be an earthly language, recognisable by someone here on earth in some corner or other, or it might be an angelic language. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, where he says, even though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, so it looks like there's both human and angelic, so we may understand some if we understood that language, but there'll be others that we don't. So this is a language, but it's simply a language that you haven't learnt, like, you know, learning French or German or something that many of us would have done at school. You were a language person yourself. You, you learned yeah. some of those languages, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I did, you know. Uh, I, I learned them at school and then went away to university and my first degree was in French and German. Um, but, you know, I can speak French and German, more French than German these days, it has to be said. Uh, German's very rusty. Um, but I learnt it by hard work a lot of hard work a lot of grafting away at grammar and reading and conversation with people but tongues is different from that doesn't need any of that it is a gift that comes from heaven and you suddenly find that sometimes people suddenly find themselves speaking in tongues and they've not even asked about it sometimes people have prayed and said to god i would love this gift because it is something that is available to everyone Paul will actually say in this section, you know, um, that the gift of tongues is open and available to all. You know, must I speak in tongues? No. May I speak in tongues? Oh, yes. So for some people, it will be as they call out to God and say, God, I would love to be released. And perhaps just as you're worshipping God, praying out loud with your English words or maybe singing for some people sometimes, and you suddenly find some different words coming and starting to flow and grow. Um, and it's not gibberish, it's not made up. I have to say, the first time I ever experienced that gift, everything in you either wants to think I'm making this up, or for me, 
because of my languages background, I thought, oh, I'm sure that's Latin that I learned at school and it's just my schoolboy Latin coming back. Uh, but of course it wasn't. So um, it's a gift and it's a gift available to, you know, whoever wants to receive it, but not something that God's going to ram down your throat so you don't have to be frightened of it. You don't have to be frightened of any gift of the Holy Spirit. And what is the point of it? Well, uh, yeah, people often ask that, don't they? Well, I, I always describe it like this. Look, at its most fundamental, uh, speaking in tongues is a prayer language. So that's how I often describe it. It's a prayer language. It's something directed towards God. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 14 too, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Um, doesn't speak to people. That is, it's not prophecy. Prophecy is from God to people. Tongues is from people to God it's back in the other direction so it is not an equivalent of prophecy though over the years I've heard people you know speak in a tongue and it be interpreted and someone said thus says the Lord I'm not sure that's really what it's meant to be from the scriptures it's a prayer language directed towards God and as a prayer language uh, it can be used for worship like it was in Acts chapter 2 verse 11 where the crowds say, you know, we can hear them speaking in our own languages and they're all extolling the mighty works of God. So that was praise. Um, it can be used for intercession. Paul hints at that in Romans 8, 26 and Ephesians 6, 18, where he talks about the spirit sort of groaning within us and something that might be a reference to this. So worship, intercession, actually in short, anywhere where Ordinary language is used, but you run out of words. You don't know how to pray. Now, there are so many times in life for myself, my family, the church that I'm part of, friends, I, I don't know how to pray. They're in a situation, I, I don't know what to do here, Lord, but I do know someone who does know, and that's the Holy Spirit. And so at points like that, to be able to pray in this prayer language, uh, Paul describes it at that point, he says, as your mind then sort of just being bypassed and your spirit speaking out instead. So it's the Holy Spirit connecting with your spirit to pray out this language. And you may not understand it. For myself, I often have a sense of what it's about, you know, not like a word for word translation, but... I can tell if it's like a calling out to God, crying out to him in intercession. I can tell if it's because I'm mad with the devil and, you know, and I want to rebuke something. So it, it's, it's an incredible gift. Sadly, in church history and sadly here in Corinth, it's been made as a badge of superiority at times. So Paul nails that one in the bud straight away which is why this gift gets listed with a whole host of other gifts. Uh, you know, it's not the first one, it's not the last one, it's one of a whole number of gifts. But the Corinthians were so caught up in this and thought that it was, you know, because they could speak in tongues or because they could stand up in a meeting and suddenly pray out in a tongue, everyone would think, oh, David is so spiritual, listen to him. That gets Paul really mad because it's not about that, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Everything in worship ought to be about Jesus. You know, the Lord's Supper there wasn't about Jesus. These speaking in tongues weren't about Jesus. Even some of their prophecies were more about them than Jesus, it seems. But for me, the fascinating thing with all of this is that Paul doesn't tell them to stop it. Now, just stop. That's enough. What he does is he corrects them. It's as if they got the right thing, but we're using it wrong. And if this had been a wrong thing, and if this was something that they'd made up or were demonic or a whole host of other things that I've heard at times over the years, he would undoubtedly have said, stop. This is not godly. This is not the way to behave. No, what he says is, you're going about this wrong. You need to use this differently, particularly when you're using it in a public church setting. I've got to ask you, can you be a Christian and not speak in tongues? Uh, yes, I'm convinced you can. Um, just like you can be a Christian and not prophesy or be a Christian and not have words of wisdom. So these are gifts that he spreads out among the body. And certainly when it comes to, if you like, a public speaking out of a tongue, there's going to be interpreting in the meeting 
which is what he'll go on to talk about uh, in chapter 14, uh, only certain people will have that gift. He'll actually say at one point, you know, does everyone prophesy? And the very construction in Greek requires the answer, no. Does everyone speak in tongues? No. But the context is so important. He's talking there about a church meeting. So does everyone have to? Absolutely not. But I think everyone can. Um, and I constantly go back to one of my favorite verses in Acts, Acts 2.38, when people say, how can we experience what you have? And he says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, is open and available to everyone. And what I would also say, secondly, is, is it possible to prove that every time people received the Spirit, they spoke in tongues in Acts? The answer is an unreserved, you cannot prove that. But I'll tell you what, every time they received the Spirit, something happened, something profound happened. When you think of Simon Magus who said, give me this gift that, you know, that I may have it, we read that when Simon saw the giving of the Spirit, did this, what, what did he see? I don't know, maybe they spun around like a child's top for all I know, but he saw something. What he might have seen is them speaking in tongues because that gets referenced in so many other places. When Peter prays for the household of Cornelius that we've seen in a previous episode, what is it that convinces him that the Spirit has come on them. He said they're speaking in tongues just like we were at the beginning. So there seems to be, how can I put it, an expectation that this would be the norm but not a compulsion. So again, my favourite phrase if people say to me, must I speak in tongues to be a Christian? My answer is no. But if you ask me, may I speak in tongues as a Christian, I will happily say, yeah, I think you can. And I will happily pray with you for that because I think the experience of countless millions of Christians through the ages and the more important the testimony of scripture itself is that this is an incredibly useful gift whether it's used yourself in the context of prayer praise warfare or whether it's used in a meeting where Paul's very clear if it's used in a meeting it must be interpreted and either you yourself might do that or another member of the body might do that. There is a view that these gifts sign gifts I think they're sometimes referred mm. to were for then and not for now. Yes, it's interesting that term sign gifts that, that some people have used over history. And my first question is, what, what do you mean by a sign gift? Because immediately what they're wanting to do is to take certain gifts there and put them in a man-made category because there is no category in scripture called sign gifts. You know, they're all mixed up together. What we might see as more natural and as more spiritual, they're, they're all in it together. So I find it very difficult to sort of feel theologically comfortable with the idea of sign gifts. But let me move on to the second bit, you know, which is really, were these just for then? Were they, were these more dramatic gifts, whether it's speaking in tongues or prophecy or miracles or praying for healing? Were they just to get the church going, which has been an argument that is used and that once church became unstoppable church and started spreading, they, they didn't need this anymore. Well, I'll tell you what, if ever we've needed the demonstration of God's power and God's spirit, it's in our own generation. And the interesting thing is whenever there's been revival in church history, you often see an outbreak of these gifts again that sometimes just gets lost in either the busyness of life or the theological paraphernalia and constructions of life. And from what you've said already, there is no kind of hierarchy when it comes to these gifts. No, not at all. And some people have tried to put them in a hierarchy, but what I'd encourage people to do is to go and look at the gifts in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, and uh, to list them maybe in three columns, and what you'll see there is overlap, but you'll also see that they're not always given in the same order, which immediately sort of hits that on the head. What we do get in Ephesians 4 is that Paul will talk about particular ministry gifts. He'll talk about, you know, God has called first apostles, second prophets. Why? Because the apostles were literally foundational to the church. Without those apostles, they would have been 
no church. The prophets, why? Because they were the ones that took the Old Testament and applied it in the light of Christ today. So he does seem to give a little bit of order there, but it's not like an order of rank. Excuse me, would you please step back, David? Because I am the apostle here. Um, this is more about a sort of functional order than a hierarchical order. And I think that's something that's really important that we keep hold of today. There might be a functional order, but there certainly isn't a hierarchical order because God wants a gifted church across the board. He wants a body, as we talked about in a previous episode, where every single part of that body is playing its part. And you said Paul, writing from Ephesus to the Christians here in Corinth, was including some application. And does he do that in a reading that is often heard at weddings? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because slap bang in the middle of chapters 12 and 14, uh, which are all about the outworking of the gifts, he has this wonderful passage, chapter 13, which is all about love. And, and you know, it seems so much of a sort of out kilter at that point that some people have thought, I'm sure Paul didn't originally put this in here and someone must have found this sort of lost chapter of Paul and stuck it in here. No, no, it's, it's very, very much designed to be there because having talked about these gifts in the context of the body and having ended chap what we call chapter 12 by saying eagerly desire the greater gifts. And by that, he means the, the gifts that enable the body of Christ to function. Having said that, eagerly desire the greater gifts, he goes straight on to say, and now I'll show you the greatest gift of all. I'll show you the most excellent way. And he will talk about love. And that well-known passage, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Oh, there would have been lots of those in these temples right here in Corinth. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, oh, and look at that acro Corinth behind us, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, how we use these gifts, using them in love, is the most important thing. And you can be the most gifted prophet or healer or miracle worker or preacher in the world. But if you're exercising that gift without love, then Paul says it's of no more value than one of those clanging symbols in the temple of Apollo and Aphrodite up there, completely meaningless. And then he unpacks it, doesn't he? Well-known words, as you say, often used in weddings, though really quite out of context for what Paul's talking about. Love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it isn't easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with truth, and it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, that's true about life generally, but it's specifically true about spiritual gifts and how they are used. And he says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, and he's thinking there of the coming of the kingdom, when the Lord Jesus returns and brings the kingdom in all its fullness, then the imperfection disappears. We won't need tongues, we won't need prophecies, we won't need words of knowledge and wisdom when Jesus is in our midst and the throne of God is in our midst. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And some have said, oh, they, Paul's saying these spiritual gifts are childish ways. No, no, this is about the manner of how they are used, not whether they are used. Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. And if we think 
that clinches it and overrules anything about any need for spiritual gifts, well, let me read the next verse, which is separated into a different chapter, but carries on in the Greek text. Follow the way of love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. It's not an either or. It's meant to be a both and. The church of Jesus Christ is meant to be the most gifted group of people on earth with natural talents heightened by the Holy Spirit and dedicated wholly to Jesus, but also with spiritual gifts dropped out of heaven by the Holy Spirit and released to us, not for our sake, not to make me look good, but to make Jesus look good and to work together towards this end of seeing unstoppable church. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner, travelling from Jerusalem to Rome and beyond to track the amazing growth of the first century church and what that means for the unstoppable church of the 21st century. There are more Bible podcasts from Mike and David on the UCB Player app and major podcast platforms. Check out Jesus Then and Now or Bible Books in 30 Minutes.